All right, guys. So this is uh, new. Our goal for the little the little classes we're going to do um, for you guys is to try to give you guys a foundation from very basic skills and concepts, and then work into some more advanced things. But primarily, what we want to be able to do is just to give you an idea of how, why, and when we do these techniques that we're going to show in these uh, instructional uh, seminars. So uh, Cindy covered our bios for us pretty much. Um, for me, yeah, like she said, I've, I've won nationals here uh, 10 or 11 times, something like that. Um, I've done semi pro fights in China. I've done, uh, been to the World Championship and American Games. Uh, I've done MMA. I'm a national judge for the USWK for Senda. Um, I think all, all overall, I met Coach Lee 15, almost 15 years ago. So I've been doing it pretty steadily for 15 years. Uh, I blew up my knee a couple of times the last few years. So I started taking more of a role in coaching. So I think that's probably why they asked me to do it because I'm so handsome. But yeah, so uh, that's me. Bruce, you got anything to say? Yeah, I did. Cindy mentioned all the, the rigor I have, you know, since I turned in on the uh, Coach Lee, like almost 10 years. And helping some kids prepare for junior world championships, you know, push Sanda more anywhere. Yeah, try to spread it as much as we can. And uh, our philosophy for Sanda, I, I think it's probably the most complete uh, sport martial art that we have today. Like, uh, it's similar to like other sports like uh, Thai boxing and stuff like that. But the difference between Sanda and other martial arts is it's not a closed sport. There's not a certain way that we do things. Everything is open. Some countries have a heavier wrestling base. Some countries have a more of a, you know, taekwondo kicking base. Some can incorporate everything really well. I think with us, we're probably more boxing oriented and very good. Actually, I think we're pretty well oriented, but I think our hands coming from Coach Lee being a, a, a successful amateur boxer before he switched to stand, I think one of our big strong points is going to be our boxing. So we're going to get, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that because I think that that's probably the easiest and most effective way is to throw hands if you have to fight your opponent. Um, but sand is a really cool sport. So the first thing we're going to get into is to talk about the rules and what you can and can't do in sand competition. So there's two sides. There's a semi-pro side and then there's an amateur side. They're scored a little bit differently. The amateur side is very methodical on how it scores and where it awards points and where it doesn't. Where the semi-pro is more of a 10-8 uh, type system like you have in boxing and MMA and other stuff like that. So to get into the rules, basically punch, kick, and wrestle. Punch, kick, and take down. Once you take your opponent down to the ground, then they stop, you have to stand back up, and you go to them. So if you've ever seen a UFC fight, it's almost the exact same except there's no jujitsu. There's no fighting on the ground. Um, some of the in amateur, there's no knees and there's no elbows. But there's also and and for younger the youth teams, there's no continuous punching to the head. I have to punch up and down or mix my kicks in. I can't continuously punch to the head or kick to the head. But amateur for adults, there's just no knees and elbows. Um, and it's fought on a late tie where I can push my opponent off and score points that way. Um, so let's get into some of the. <clears throat> the rules and how I score in Sanda and some common questions that people have. So one big, uh, one big point that I have uh, to address is people always ask is, is Sanda like point spawn? Like uh, in karate, I'm not really familiar with other martial arts other than Sanda. So point karate and stuff like that, where I touch my opponent and I get a point, they always ask is it point spawn or point fighting? It's not. They took the, the, the way it scored is a really methodical way of trying to exactly determine who wins and who loses, who landed more clean shots, who was uh, scoring more points, who lost less points. So that way they can determine a winner. There's never a draw, really. If there's a draw, well, there's never a draw because if two fighters were even, the draw will go to the lowest uh, by, the way, by the weight class. Of so that's one of the things that I really appreciate about, about the sport is there's a big big focus on we don't want bad decision-making and bad judging that plagues other sports like boxing and MMA. So 
let's just get into some of the how, how some of the ways to score. So if I land a clean shot on Bruce's head, um, and make it sound and show displacement, clear technique, and impact, I, I'm going to score one point for a clean shot to his head or to his body, right? Whether it, it doesn't matter where, as long as it's in the scoring zone, right? It can't hit in the back of the head. So one point for that. Same one point for low kicks. Below the waist is one point. If I keep Bruce in the torso, meeting all the criteria, clear technique, sound, displacement, I score two points for kicks above the waist. If I take Bruce down and I come down with Bruce, it's only one point for me. If I take Bruce down and I don't come down, I get two points. Now, where some of the confusion gets in scoring is something like this. Let's say Bruce kicks, bam, very good kick, but I catch, I can't do nothing. We go back. Most people would think, oh, well, he caught his kick. It's no point. No, it's a clear technique, impact, sound, and displacement. He gets two points. My inability to take him down doesn't change the fact that he scored. Okay? Now, technically, he kicked me low. Bam. One good, good sound good, meets the criteria. He scores. Bam. I take Bruce down. I get two points. He gets one. Okay? So, there's some complications when it comes to uh, the system and scoring like that. But for the most part, that's the basis. You're more than welcome. I think the USAWCAP has a rule book online. They update it every year because they've been changed. Okay, so the first uh, little technique you want to get into because we're going to treat all you guys like your beginners. It's going to be pretty much almost like a, the first couple of classes that we, teach is, that we teach the people that come into the gym to check out our program. So. I'm going to come up here and we're going to show you guys how to wrap your hands. So I'll wrap both of my hands. So the point of wrapping your hands is you don't necessarily have to do it this way. I do it probably, there's three or four ways that you can wrap your hands. I usually shuffle in between two. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the side that's obvious, the bottom right. I have the printed stars and stripes and I have the the non-printed side, so that's going to be the side that doesn't show. It's going to come on top of my ankle like so. I hook the thumb loop on my thumb, and I start on my wrist. The most important thing about wrapping your hands and why is two things. I want to lock out my wrist to get extra support so that when I punch, I don't hurt myself. And I also want to help stabilize my thumb. So I'll wrap around my thumb two or three times. I'll come over the, or my wrist two or three times. Now, here's an important part. When I lock out my thumb, I'm going to come from the bottom. See, it's on the bottom of my wrist, over the top of my thumb, hold it, grab it, pull it tight, and come back around the wrist. So now I'm right back to where I started, but now my thumb is locked out, right? So, get this untangled. Now I will come up to the top of my hand, to where my knuckles are, right? And I'll wrap a couple more times. It depends on how long your wraps are. I like the long elastic wraps that gives me a little bit tighter feeling. I feel like it makes my hand harder when I hit this. So now when I come back under, there's another important part. So now I've, I've wrapped the top of my hand and I've returned back to the bottom of my wrist. Now I'm gonna come through my pinky and here's a little experience technique. I'm going to squeeze, keeping that tight, coming back, coming back through the next finger. Squeeze, making it tight, because I don't want this part to become loose. Now I come back, go through the other finger, squeeze. Now I come, wrap around my wrist a few more times. Now I will return back to the top of my hand, and I'll just do that to cover up kind of that mess I just made as far as those knuckles. And then I come back to my wrist and lock it up, right? Now, I'll show you an easier way with the other one, which I don't have... I usually do the one, this one I just showed you, but now I'll show you it a little bit easier that I usually make the kids do, just because there's been some amateur events that we've fought in where they don't want you to wrap in between your knuckles. Um, most of the time in any of the big fights, they wrap your hands at Worlds and Pan Ams and the amateur side of the same, you wrap your own hands, they just check. I've been told before not to wrap between my knuckles, so just in case that ever happens, we're going to follow the same, the same, uh, Format. So I'm going to come across my wrist a few times. I'm going to lock my thumb out from the bottom. 
locking over the top of my thumb, holding it to keep it tight, coming back to my wrist, right? So now I'm back to my uh, original point under the wrist. Now I'm gonna come up to my hand. Now here the difference is I'm gonna put a pretty good layer of this on top of my knuckles since this way I'm not gonna wrap between my hands. So I'm gonna wrap it almost till I run out of wrap to begin with, to begin with, to finish with, right? Now once I get a pretty decent padding there, my knuckles are covered, everything feels pretty good. I'll return back to my wrist and continue again to lock out my wrist to get extra support. So I wrap them fairly tight. You'll, the more you do it, you know, I mean, everybody wraps their hand a little bit differently, right? Bruce probably wraps his a little bit differently. Sometimes I'll add a sponge and do the second tech, the second way I just showed you. If I have like some, you know, pain in my knuckles or anything like that. But you'll eventually get used to how you like to do it. The more you do it, you'll figure out what you like, what you don't like. Some wraps are longer. If you have the short wraps, you maybe don't need to go so many times around your wrist or around your knuckles, but you're also probably not going to get to go in between your fingers. So if you're going to go in between your fingers, you probably need the uh, extra long wraps. So now we did the hand wraps. Now let's get into the first thing we do, and we do a little seven point stance to help build these beginners. And then I'll show you a little bit of a cheat cut, a shortcut. So like just a simple three point stance. So, so we're gonna start with our feet together like we're in the military. And we usually, this is just for the kids. It's a good exercise for kids to learn and start to, well, one, if they can't count, it helps. So yeah, if, it's two, <laughs> if two, like it helps them get a, uh, a foundation for how they should stand. So one, I step out shoulder width apart. Two, I take a step forward. I'm not wide or too much, just nice and relaxed. If I'm sideways, just nice and relaxed. So, three, I rotate my feet 90 degrees. What's the right angle, Bruce? 45 or 90? 45. Oh, 90 degrees. So now I'm going to raise my hands, sit them on my chest where they're just hanging. I don't want to hold, we don't want to hold our hands up or I'm going to burn my lats out, right? It's going to get so heavy after I'm moving around. Holding my arms up. Now, I'm going to touch my eye sockets with the, with the, what would that be, the first knuckle outside of the two knuckles, I hit the second knuckle. I'm going to touch my eye sockets. The reason we do this isn't because it's the way Bruce is going to hold his guard. For some reason, if you tell a guy to touch his eye sockets like this with those two knuckles, it always gives him a good wrist sweep, a good bend in his wrist on how to punch, right? We don't want to punch with it bent. We don't want to punch with it down, right? So, Go back. I used to say punch like a girl, but then there's some girls that can really fight, so that's not true. So punch like a, we don't want to punch like that. So back to my head. Now, when I rotate back to the front, I rotate my feet. My hands are still, my arms are still setting on my chest. My, my hands now are not going to touch my face. They're just going to rotate out, keeping that good bend. Now, the last position, Bruce, you stay there. The last change is my head. It's 60% of my weight on my front foot and 40 on my back, okay? So I like this stance. You can, some guys change their different styles. So whatever we discuss in the video doesn't necessarily mean that I think one's better than the other. Of course, I like this style better or whatever. I have my opinions and how I, you know, fighting is problem solving with like really bad consequences if you make a mistake. But... I like this and we can talk about why. So if Bruce faces me, if I'm 50, 50, I always feel like, I feel like I punch, you can throw very good punches and stuff like that. But I feel like I'm cheating myself because if I was 60, 40, I can punch farther. My chin down, I'm safer. And not most of the time, the guy who's more committed to exchanging and the guy who's more comfortable is going to be more successful, right? So, if I'm 50-50, I'm going to punch a little bit shorter. Of course, I can jump in and do things. Maybe I like this displacement with, with weight evenly between my feet so I can kick better. But for us, I like having my head 60% of the weight on my front foot, 40 on my back. My back heels up. I like my head above my leg. The reason is because I feel like it's a more advantageous position for me to fight. And, I'll talk, and let's go over a couple of reasons why. 
if Bruce's elbows are in and he's in a good stance, his head above the front leg, if I touch Bruce, he can, if guard's already there, of course I can play later when I'm more experienced. But in the beginning, I like his hands and his elbows being in because he's going to squeeze his elbows. Ah, I can touch him. He can touch me right back. If Bruce tries to shoot on me, wow, I'm in a good position to score. If I'm standing straight up, Bruce shoots on me. I have a harder time score. Right? I like, there's a lot of contact when you spar in a fight, right? A lot of bodies slamming into each other when Bruce throws the hand out the way and fight and you slam into each other, right? If I'm lower and in a stronger position and Bruce stands up and goes, ah, I'm in a lot better position than Bruce to do whatever I want to do, right? So for us, it's the, if this is the best way for me to stand, I can defend the shot, I'm light on my feet, I can punch longer. I'm, if Bruce touches me, bam, I can touch him back. I feel like it's a more advantageous stance than most. It doesn't mean that there's not other stances better for kicking or better stances for wrestling, but I think it's a good stance for the sport that we're on. Okay? You good? Yeah. You, you fight like that? Most fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's how we stand, right? Let's go one more time through the stand. And then we'll talk about how we move. So just a quick reminder. So the shortcut that we usually do after the kid kick the seven point one, two, eight, four, five, six, seven, right? Think about it like this. Sparring, standards are sport just like any other sport. If you play baseball or basketball, you know your common sport, sport stance is here, right? Knees bent, back straight, right on my feet, ready to go. All I'm going to do is keep my knees, take a step forward, bring my hands up, elbows in, get comfortable in there. It's the exact same stance, except with if we're coming forward, back heel up, head above my front knee, hands up, elbows in, right? Good stance. Here, head above my front knee, back heel up, right? Elbows in. All right. Now let's move on to how we actually move. Okay. All right. Let me interrupt you for a second. Okay. So just to answer for those that doesn't know, what does the sprawl mean? Oh, sprawl? Sprawl is just a basic takedown defense. Where Bruce has my leg, he has all the leverage to pick me up and slam me down, right? Look, he's underneath me, my weight's on him. So a sprawl is going to be me moving my weight away from outside of Bruce's. If you've ever done a squat, right? Bruce does a squat, puts the weight on his back, he comes up and down, right? Wrestling, same thing. He shoots in, my weight is on his back, he's going to be able to pick me up and take me down. So a sprawl is a way for me to move the weight displacement of my body outside of, off of Bruce's muscles, right? So the way I sprawl is I kick my leg back and put my weight on top of him, so now the weight is on the back part of my body and it's impossible for him to pick it up. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, back to moving. Ooh, right? yes. yeah, yeah. So, we get in our fighting stance. Now I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have Bruce do this and I'm just gonna talk. So Bruce is in a good stance. We'll never teach you guys, or at least in our gym, we're never gonna teach people to change stances really because Coach Lee has always been real big on that. I mean, I fight 25 years like this. I'm, I'm not even that good at that. So why would I try to do both? So we just don't change stances. So that means Bruce is never gonna cross his feet He's never going to get too wide or too narrow. If this is the best stance for us to do all those things we just talked about in, we need to always stay in. So coming forward, Bruce is just simply going to reach with his front foot and follow with his back, right? So now he does it in one foot motion, step and step, right? So he goes forward, one, two, right? My starting spot is my finishing spot. So if I move my front foot two inches, my back foot follows two inches, okay? So, going forward, one, everything is the same, so I'm back. If I start to move forward, keep you close together, it's gonna be a problem, right? So, going forward, one, two, very easy. Going backwards, same principle. I'm gonna use the leg in the direction that I wanna go, and that's how I'm gonna go first. I just reach for my back foot and follow my front. Reach with my back foot, follow with my foot, okay? Same thing, I don't want to get narrow. If I'm on railroad tracks, I can tell the kids, I don't want to get too wide, now I have no balance. 
Same thing if I'm too narrow, especially when wrestling the ball. So now left and right. Same thing. I'm not going to cross because now I'm in deep trouble. Maybe with a big leg kick, I'll fall over. Even if I stand too narrow, all my weight's in one line, big leg kick will take me out. There's actually a lot of wrestling techniques that are meant for when the guy doesn't stand correctly. So moving to our left, we just reach with our left foot and go with our right foot. One more time. Good. When we come back to the right, we reach with our right foot, follow with our left foot. Go on our stand. We don't have to, if you watch me and Bruce's feet, we don't take second steps, like a second guessing step. Go, Bruce. We don't have to, oh, Bruce took a second step. So when we go to the left, watch. There's no extra steps. We've done this so long that pop, pop, my body knows exactly where it goes. Okay? Now, here's where we're going to get a little weird. 45 degrees or 90. 45. 90 because 45 is a box. So 90 degrees. Oh, yeah. So 90 degrees to the corner, right? Now, this is where the steps are a little bit weird. If you're left handed, it could be opposite. So we're just going to pretend everybody's right hand. So when I step to the corner with my right leg, I just reach one, two, back to my stand. Okay, let's pop it back a little bit so we can do a couple. So I reach one, two. Good. One, two. Right now, when I go backwards, I reach with my left leg, going towards Bruce. Bruce is going to go back that same direction. One, two. Right? When I go back again, one, two. No second step. All right? Now, come back. Now, 90 degrees to the left. It's just like going forward. We're just going towards that direction. So me and Bruce, boom. One, two. Very easy. One, two. When I go back, same thing. One, two. One, two. Now, Everything in our curriculum that we teach the beginners, a lot of times people think like, well, that's a weird step. Like when would me and Bruce ever have to do this step? Right? Well, look, for example, everything that we start to show, same thing with what we show you guys today, they'll always be building blocks into something more technical, right? Usually a harder movement. So from these steps, we're going to dodge into these steps. One, two, one. Um, two. Um, right? So, everything we show, even though it maybe is weird in the beginning, trust me, they have a, uh, we have our purpose, right? So, other thing about the steps, it is the most important thing ever. I don't know how many times we have guys come in here, Bruce, and Bryce, so you this. How many times we have people come in here and they're just, they've trained at other gyms, they've done other martial arts, and they're just really shocked at how much time we spend on moving. Basically, we'll, the basic step, right? All these steps, right? So some drills you can do with these steps is for the partner. So we're going to talk about how, when, and why. So you guys, we assume now you know how to step. Basic drills you can do with your friend or your partner at the gym where you train it. My partner up with Bruce, we're in good stance. I lead, Bruce has to follow. Right, whether we turn or if he does laterally. Oh, yeah, laterally. So if we go this way, Bruce just mirrors me, right? If I go forward, he goes backwards. So we do this a lot with the beginners and the kids, right? So the more advanced we will circle. So the more advanced step is where I just reach for my left foot, like we're going 90 degrees, but I'm gonna just pivot a little bit to face Bruce, right? If I do the other side, my right foot goes first, just like we did, and face boost. Right foot, face boost. Right? If I go forward, you goes backward. Okay? Cool. So, now let's move on to some punching. So, this is going to take up a little bit of time because we're going to go through jab, cross, hooks, and uppercuts, which are pretty much the only punches we do. Yeah. So, let's start with jab. So, if you're right-handed, your jab is going to be your left hand. If you're right-handed, my jab is going to be my uh, jab. If I'm right-handed, my jab is my left hand. If I'm left-handed, my jab is my right hand. It's your lead hand. So let's get up a little bit, Bruce, so they can see here. Yeah, you can be left-handed for the video. So watch. Bruce is going to pretend he's left-handed, and I'm going to uh, pretend I'm right-handed because I am. So I should be able to pretend for fairly well. So most important thing about punching is. I have to use my big muscles, my back, my butt, my legs, to throw my arms at people. People have, there's a big misconception that, you know, you hear arm puncher, the term arm puncher a lot. 
which means I have decent hands, but I don't use my body. So therefore, I'm not going to have any impact in that momentum or uh, weight. I'm not going to hit that hard, honestly. So first thing, I hope I'll show, I'll show you how to put a punch and we'll get into this technique about flying out. Bruce is always going to keep his left elbow in line with his hip. And we're going to pretend that our, hand, our elbow is attached to our hip. So when I move my hip, my hand comes out. Right? Yeah. Out, bottom, right down the middle, right? Yes, I'm tall. You stay there. I think I'm taller than you. So when I rotate, we rotate our hips, bomb, we punch right down the middle, we come back. Okay? So I'm using my butt and my back to push my hand down. I'm not letting my hand punch. Right? I want to punch as long and be as safe as possible. So my chin's down, my other hand's up. I turn my butt, bam, throw all the way out. Now, let's talk about some other stuff. These are your good ones. If it's, there's so much about techniques, there's a reason how and why your body will do the movement and it'll find a way to do it more efficiently, right? Like I tell all the beginners, like they can come in and they can punch hard. You get these big muscle guys that want to fight and stuff. And they can punch hard. But the problem is they can't punch efficiently. They can't punch. Correctly. correctly, they can't punch more than 10 minutes because this will make me tired. So, now let's talk about some fundamentals. If Bruce keeps his elbow in, he jabs, bang, it's right down the middle. It's, I always say it's like throwing a spear or stab a guy with it, right? I'm going to stab it. I don't want to slap it with the back of my hand. Bruce, when he jabs, he also does it very, very important. Never wants to cross the center line unless he has his breathing. Okay? So once face me, Bruce, and get me a little bit. So if Bruce punches down the middle, fine. It's hard for me because when he comes back, face the camera again, please. His hand from the jet, bam. It stays in the same punch right there for that. Go. His hand stays in the same spot when I'm looking at, right? Where if he opens his elbow and launch it, it always comes from the outside and it's easier for me to see. So like if Bruce, if I'm in my guard, Bruce goes to the jab, pop, you see guys get jabbed between their hands. But because it's hard for me to judge the distance because that space stays right there and his hand stays there, it just comes. If he opens, now here's the other thing. If Bruce opens, switch with your elbow. If Bruce opens his elbow, now punch out. It's hard. All this good momentum and turning and weight distribution that he used to punch hard gets wasted in this space in his elbow. Because now he has like a sponge there, right? If he puts his elbow down and pushes out, it's hard for me to stop him because everything works, works in a straight line, right? And it works better. So now when he jabs, he jabs, bam, his wrist, his elbow, his shoulder, his back, his butt, even his legs are all in line to deliver power. If it slides off, he's in trouble. Especially, especially when he jabs, Wow. And I get off of it, he punches off the wrong line. But now I have a chance, whether it's that or he comes off, wow. I can shoot and start the wrestle, right? If Bruce stays in a good stance, wow. he throws a good punch, he can pull it right back. Over here. Now, if he throws it out and everything's good, he didn't fall over, he can just throw the other one. Wow. He's always in a good stance to deliver power, whatever punch he wants. If I keep my head in the center, I rotate my head. No matter what punch I want to do, I can continually throw up punches. But if me or Bruce fall over, no matter what the next move is, even if I try to punch, I have to make up this weight distribution problem I just created. My head outside of my leg. So now I have to run at the guy to fix my weight. So if you've ever seen those early MMA fights or those guys who don't have to strike and you see them running, it is because they don't have the fundamentals of steps and how to stand correctly and punch correctly. All right, so that should jab. Cross punch. So cross punch, same thing. Bruce is gonna keep his elbows in. He's gonna pretend his hip and his elbow are connected. He's gonna rotate his back foot like he's squishing a bug like you tell the kids, which is just a trick to make him use his hip, okay? If Bruce doesn't, the, the reason we do this drill is once they understand these movements, I try to get them to do it continuously. See how my elbows, my arms stay flat like a table? There's no crazy circle motion. My head stays in the same spot. 
So now I know if I have that, bam, I can deliver power bam, efficiently and using my hips. Okay? Now, uppercuts. Uppercuts are going to be the same movement with my body, but a different angle with my elbow and hand than a hook. So the first, we'll just show you. So the lead uppercut is up, bam. I use my hip. Back right up, uh, your left hand, my right hand. Back over cut. Shh. 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 All right, so everything is pretty much going to be the same as far as my lower body down. The only thing that's going to change is the angle at which I punch. Okay, now this angle is pretty much all is good. You know what I'm saying? Like any angle is good. Like if I hit Bruce in the liver, I load just like my left hook, but now I'm coming up. Bop into his liver, right? If I go for his head, I look, I'm throwing horizontally, bop. Sometimes, so this angle is almost uh, 90 degrees coming up towards his other shoulder. This one's flat, sometimes right up the middle, bam, it's almost vertical. Same thing with my right hand, right? So the angle can change as long as you do what you're supposed to do with your lower body and how to deliver power with your arms. It, anything from here to here is cool depending on what target you're going after, okay? So first thing we're going to do with our hook, I mean our upper hook. My head's above my front knee, I'm going to drop my hand, knee, drop my, bend my knees, and drop my elbow, you say that, drop my elbow like I'm doing a curl, curl for the girls, right? Everybody's got big muscles. So watch, one, five, right here. I don't want to come lower because then my hook gets too slow. Right, I want it to be somewhat high. I bend my knees, bam, I drop like I'm doing a curl. Now, my hip drives my elbow up, and my elbow is coming towards the center line like Bruce is in front of his face now, right? So down, up, bam. My weight's driving with my front hip. One, two, same thing as before. I don't want my hand to come so far off I'm off balance and cross that center line, okay? So one, two. Back to my head. One, two, back to my head. Other common question with the uppercut is, and the same thing with the hook is, how do I hold my hand? Do I hold it this way? Do I hold it that way? Doesn't matter. Uppercuts, I've heard people say before, if I, yeah, if I punch with my uppercut with my fist vertical, but I can come between Bruce's hands easier with my glove. Sure, I mean, I, it, it doesn't matter. Um, whatever you, whichever one you practice is the one you're going to be good at. So like for me, I'm actually kind of weird. I hit the mitt and the punching bag with my hand facing me, right? Like uh, this, this way. But when I spar or fight, I throw it the opposite way. I throw it with my hand facing down. So how do you throw it? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Are you positive? Positive. Good. So, so yeah, so hook. So now it's good. That's your lead hook. Now our lead up Now let's talk about your backhand. Again, it's going to be very similar to your uppercut and your, or no, really similar to your cross punch and your hook. I bend my knees, drop my elbow, same thing, I'm going to rotate my hips, just like I'm throwing across from here, bam, coming up down the center line. Other point important for all of these, no matter what other, what punch I'm doing with hook or uppercut or jab, my other hand is covering my face. Down, up, bam, I rotate coming towards the center line. Down, up, bam, with my hips, not my arms, not just my arms. Down, up on my hips and my butt, bam, coming up, okay? Now, jab, hook, cross, uppercut. Drills, concepts, we did. All right, so let's move into the last, I believe, 10 minutes before we get to the Q&A. We're going to go over a little bit of kicking um, and just how and why. So, front kick first, because we might not make it to roundhouse, we might do it next week. Or uh, later this week. So, a month, I think. So, front kick. Let's go for the And face that way. So, now, front kick. Uh, throw a front kick, Bruce. It is sick. Right, throw a waist back. Bruce, like, keep up waist back. It is sick. Right, good. Now, front kick has, a front kick has, for me primarily, is more of a deep, but I, I, I use it more defensively. It can be used offensively. Um, to set things up, but as far as a big attack movement where uh, uh, trying to kick Bruce uh, through the wall, remember in Santa we can catch. So the bigger the movement I give Bruce, the more likely he's going to be able to catch me. Okay, so 
front kick. My knee is going to come up, and I'm, we're going to face the thing. Our rotation, almost every kick we teach, our supporting foot is going to rotate, right? So if we break it down into steps, like you're brand new, I rotate, one. Two, my knee is going to come up, bomb, and come back down, okay, just for this. We break it into steps, so we'll do this a couple times. Rotate, knee up, all right? No, rotate, knee up. Now what we're going to change is I'm going to go rotate, knee up, same hand, same leg. So meaning my left hand stays up, bomb. I reach out with my right hand, just like I think coach uses the swimming, right? Swimming. Push, push the air down. Like, I, don't, I don't know if that helps, but it's a good analogy. I guess. So rotate, up, bomb. <laughs> Pushing down with my right hand. I don't want to throw it. I don't want to lean too crazy. I just want to be totally relaxed. It helps with my balance. Bomb. Now, last step. When I kick out, my knee's gonna come up, my hand's gonna come down. I'm not kicking up into Bruce. Yes, there's point front kicks where I try to kick his face and all that stuff. But a typical, just basic front kick, I'm gonna kick him in the gut, my knee's gonna come out, and at the last second, my hip is gonna extend out, rotating, pushing out like a pull, pull cue. Like pull. My arm is my back, my leg is a pull cue. My butt is where my hand is, and I pop, I stab with my back and my butt, right? So the reason is, so I'll show you. My knee comes up, pop, and I lean back at the last second in coordination with my extension and with my back. Pop, and kick as far and long as I can. Now, let's talk about if Bruce is in his stance, don't go take your foot and give you your leg. Here, so you can straighten. So if Bruce kicks, a front kick without rotating his foot. He keeps his body square. He has very beautiful uh, hairless legs. So, that's something I don't know. So, if he doesn't rotate his bottom foot or extend his hip, this is all he's got. Now he rotates his foot. See how his knee came up? Come back. Now rotate and let the knee come up. Yes, because he, he, now he, since he opened his hip, it moved his pelvis force. Now he has all this extra extension that he can use, right? Now pull it back. So the last part of this kick, everything should look like this. If we filmed it in slow motion, Bruce's hands down, the other side's up. His extension, go Bruce, bomb, is his back meaning his, his foot driving forward. Pull it back, go, bomb. See that extension with his back, how he slightly leans back at the same time he extends the last foot? Bomb, here, okay? Uh, common questions with front kick, do I want to stab him with the balls of my feet, or do I want to kick him flat-footed? Um, we do the point front kick. I'm not a big fan of it because too many times I've tried to kick that way, and I kick right on his elbow on the ball of my foot, and it just, oh, it hurts. And then I'm moving around trying to pretend it doesn't hurt, and then I don't get to throw it again, you know. So anyways, but I usually tell my students or our students to, I want you to knee in your chest and pretend like you're kicking over a door because another common problem is this, is a little snap kick to his hoo-ha, which I don't want to do that, right? I want to kick him in the gut. So I tell him, if I had to make you kick down a door, you wouldn't snap kick into the, the, the door, you'd hurt your toes, right? I want my knee to come up and put my whole foot into his chest, driving him back, okay? So now let's talk about some concepts on how and why, or we already did how, but why. Front kicks for me, like I said, I don't like to be super aggressive, Bruce will catch. And now I have to defend this, this uh, he's going to be trying to take me down. My lead leg, so when you practice your front kicks, you practice with your back leg in the same building system we just did. Switch your stance and practice your left leg in the same system. Now once you're pretty efficient at it, you can do a lead leg front kick without, well, without having to switch your stance, right? <coughs> so. This front kick is very, 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 very effective in Thai boxing and Sandal, right? If I'm taller, if I have good punch, and maybe Bruce doesn't, but he has good kicks, he gives me his front kick. Wow. He can keep me away. He can kick farther than I can punch, right? I can, Bruce comes, no, no, I can stop Bruce from coming, right? I'm not going to hurt him, but I'm going to, well, maybe, but. I'm not trying to hurt him as much as I'm trying to keep him away from me. A lot of times, don't tell, don't tell anybody this, uh, I would fight and get really tired and push him. Go out there in front kick and, uh, uh, like I'm trying to breathe, trying to keep him away from me, right? 
But this movement can be used for so much. Oh, oh I'm gonna broke your knee. Oh, oh, ah, right? I can start to play with this front lead leg. I think this is one of the, what do you call it? Like, front, front kick, front leg, lead leg, front kick, man, it's a very, very important tool to have if you ever start to compete or you uh, spar a lot for fun, right? Like, it's hard. Once I, once Bruce breaks my confidence, hey. every time I punch, now I'm nervous about, well, if I try to go, Bruce going to give me that front kick. And then Bruce will use it against me. He'll raise his knee, fake me, and give me a big shot. Or he'll use his knee, fake and shoot. Whew. Right? So it's a good way to start playing a game with your opponent, right? Okay, uh, I think we got five more minutes left for the Q&A. So. That's five minutes left. Uh, if anybody has question, please type in the chat or the Q and A. And meanwhile, since we didn't get to the all the kicks uh, this week, we will introduce you uh, to on the twenty seventh June twenty seventh. We will have another Sanda session. And if you are interested, please follow along on that day. And if possible, Corey and Bruce, can you just show us all the remaining kicks as a preview? Yeah, the next class we have scheduled the roundhouse and the side kick. And so we'll just go real quick. Roundhouse, same concept. Bruce is going to rotate his front foot and he's going to come up. Except now, instead of using the bottom of his foot, he's going to use the lower part of his shin to either kick my leg, kick my body, fish, or kick my head. Go for it. Yeah. All right, so... Roundhouse we'll get into. The other is the kick that we'll probably spend the most time on and the way we do it in the gym we spend the most time on is because it is the kick that's probably one of the hardest outside, well, it's hard and outside of the wrestling skills that Sandra has from the traditional Chinese wrestling that makes Sandra unique is the side kick is really unique for uh, Sandra too. Where Bruce brings his knee straight up and drives and digs into me with no... Most traditional, uh, like I've seen a lot of Taekwondo and karate guys, they come to the knee first and then they go out or they do these big loopy knees to where Sandman is very, very efficient coming up and straight out. Very long. And this one like, can be used the same way as a front kick, but it's 10 times more power. Okay. But we can cover that in the next class and then we'll start getting into strategies. Okay your feet together and uh no question okay so can you also explain a little bit since uh it's a fundamental class and there might be people who have never uh like look at sanda before can you explain the sports basically it includes that combined punch kicks and throwing part which we didn't cover today can you just explain that a little bit repeat the question again cindy you broke up so basically, uh, Sanda is a sport that combines punching, kicking, and throwing parts, in which right. we didn't get to that. Can you just briefly explain in the competition setting, how does that all three combine? Right. The other, another very, that's a good question, actually. Another very unique thing that I think Sanda brings to martial arts, especially if someone wanted to compete in MMA or whatever, is the ability to how they, because the scoring emphasis is heavy for wrestling, right? If I can take Bruce down, it's big points. Like, man, most fights when you're judging, if I take the guy down 10 times in the round, it's going to be hard for him to beat me, even if he lands clean shots, right? Like, because if I'm taking him down so much, it's just such a dominant way to uh, beat your opponent, which is why, like, you have countries like Russia, China, Iran. Iran. They're very, very wrestling oriented. So, in a competition setting, one of the biggest things that I think makes Sandy unique is their ability to mix punching, kicking, and wrestling all together. So, for example, some advanced stuff we do is I want to do my punch and kick combination, but I want to set Bruce up to where I can wrestle. So I'm going to throw a combination kick and counter, right? So, pom, pom, pom. He tries to counter. I catch and I wrestle. There's or I, or I fake with Bruce, bam, he tries to give me a right hand. Ooh, bam. I use my skip, my punching and kicking to set up wrestling. And that, man, is, that's what I think makes Sanda such a cool sport is that 
for breakfast? And you have to take down people in three seconds? Yeah, you have to. You only have three seconds to take the guy down. So if I'm stuck on Bruce and I can't do it, they're going to break. You don't get to push them all over the ring like in other sports. Got it. Okay, thank you. We have one more question. Okay. Uh, if, could you say the names in Chinese as usual in other martial arts like karate or taekwondo? Can, do we say the names in Chinese when we do it? Yeah, I think that, that's the question. Like in our setting, like no, like uh, other than Coach and Bruce, Nobody speaks Chinese, so like, uh, do we have any Chinese students? No. Nah, so we usually do it all in English. Yeah. Okay, I mean, that's a question. Next, we can have Bruce teach it, uh, say some of the stuff in Chinese if they'd like. Okay. Okay, I think that's the time. Now it's uh, 3.55 Central Time, 4.55 Eastern, and we are wrapping up the session. The next session will be... Um, the next session is Beyond Tai Chi Fundamental. And if you are interested, please stick around. You will come up in five minutes. And thank you, uh, Coach Bruce and Coach Jack uh, Corey. Thank you. Y'all keep watching. Have a good one.